Again, um, I just want to say thanks again to Affinity Water, who, who are our main sponsors at the event. Um, Alistair Leggett's going to lead this um, discussion group on cover crops, so here we go. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, thank you for taking the time to uh, join us for our uh, speakers panel discussion today. Um, the focus that we want to look at today is around cover crops, but building on kind of some of the wider benefits that cover crops can potentially derive, both for soil, for water, and the wider environment. So uh, we've put together a bit of a speakers panel today to have a bit of a discussion, have a bit of an introduction to each aspect of um, what we're looking at from a point of view of cover crops. Um, just to introduce myself and Affinity Water, so I'm Alistair Leggett, um, I manage the catchment management programme for Affinity Water. Now Affinity Water are the local water supply company for this area, um, we're actually the largest of the water only companies in the UK. Now I guess you'd ask the question, you know, why, why are Affinity Water at Groundswell, what's our interest here? Well, I mean obviously the, the event is within our supply area and it's a fantastic opportunity to speak to lots of farmers and landowners, both in our area but also from, from around the country and, and internationally. Um, but we also um, operate in an area of uh, severe water stress. Um, so actually we've got some very major challenges with um, the ability to supply water to an ever-growing population with large-scale development happening in this region, also um, looking at the effects of climate change. So um, from our perspective, um, really looking at our catchments and getting our catchments working properly, um, both in terms of um, natural recharge of our groundwater, which is very much a, a chalk groundwater area, but also protecting the quality of the water that was available to us to, uh, to supply to our three and a half million customers. Um, we've become very interested in the way that land is managed um, and particularly um, around some of the water quality issues we have, um, predominantly um, nitrate in this area, um, so we have long-term leaching of nitrate loss from um, agriculture into groundwater and once it's in the groundwater it's very expensive, very challenging to remove. So it's very much in our interest to reduce the amount of nitrate that gets into groundwater and uh, you know from, from looking at ways we could do that we've become very interested in cover crops and it's something that we've been keen to explore in a bit more detail um, but building on that as, as, as we've learned a little bit more and uh, you know we have been running within this area including with the, with the cherries a number of cover crop trials and this has been looking at different types of cover crops and um, how they can actually pre prevent leaching of nitrate so we've had some very interesting studies going on over the last few years and demonstrating that to some of our local farmers and in in some cases we've seen up to an 80% reduction in nitrate leaching compared to a control plot. So we can see there's definitely something in this and we want to explore the science a lot more and really as a water company enter into the debate around cover crops, some of the benefits, potentially some of the issues that arise from it and really see how we can actually assist farmers in, in, in kind of building this into the system and you know having the opportunity to speak at Groundswell and, and visit all the talks and the stands it's been a fantastic opportunity for us. Um, we've also um, recently, um, we've been looking at ways we could actually encourage the uptake of cover crops and try and create a marketplace for this. Um, I mean, it's, you know, as, as a business looking to procure an ecosystem service, in this case, a wider uptake of cover crops, we actually looked at the, a reverse auction and we've recently run a pilot in this area using um, the N-Trade platform and there's a bit of information on N-Trade just outside of the conference barn. Um, we ran it as a pilot to see whether there would be interest, we see whether we'd get uptake. And I mean, it's been phenomenally successful. I mean, we've had over 500 um, hectares of pledges for cover crops, of which we will be providing funding towards. Um, that's over 12 farms within this um, within this area. And, you know, we're, we're estimating that that may actually reduce the amount of nitrate getting into the groundwater by about 25,000 kilos. So, so there's certainly something in there that we want to kind of build, develop and grow. Um, and then we're also looking beyond this, actually, you know, what other benefits can we derive from this? I mean, we know that, you know, cover crops can provide a fantastic store for carbon. So as a business, you know, we also have a carbon reduction commitment. So we're looking at maybe there's an opportunity for offsetting there. Um, 
we have a number of um, kind of rare chalk streams within our supply area where it's under uh, you know severe stress from extraction from climate change and actually if we can reduce the soil loss to those rivers and particularly in areas where we're doing a program of river restoration there's a fantastic opportunity here to hold the soil on the land which obviously has a massive benefit for farmers in terms of improving you know soil structure biology but also means that we don't have to remove that soil from our processes as well so there seems to be a lot of wind but we want to build our knowledge and understanding around that. And I guess the final aspect that we're looking at is actually, you know, we, we, we depend on wind to recharge um, of our aquifers, our groundwater, in order to supply for the following year. And as I'm sure many of you are aware, we've experienced a number of dry winters over the years, and we've seen our groundwater um, depleted to a point where, you know, we, we are, you know, at points where we may have to issue temporary um, reduction in abstraction, um, you know, hose pipe bands that kind of thing which clearly we want to avoid and you know there, there is a lot of interest around whether cover crops could actually improve the natural infiltration slow water down stop it running off into the rivers and out into the estuaries whether it can naturally filter back into groundwater so another area that we're particularly interested in so that kind of just gives a bit of background why affinity water are here and why we're up here talking about cover crops but um, I just wanted to um, introduce our uh, kind of esteemed speakers panel um, each uh, member is going to give a five minute overview from their perspective around the growing of cover crops, working within the industry or the environmental side of that. So we've got Paul Brown um, who works for Kings. Paul is the Eastern Technical Advisor for Kings and been advising farmers on crop varieties and seeds for 43 years as well as working full time. He runs a family farm that grows cover crops. We've also got um, Rebecca Rinman, who um, represents uh, FWAG East. Now, um, Rebecca is a farm environment advisor and has been for 22 years giving on-farm advice. Um, prior to that, she worked for seven years on a range of farm enterprises, including sheep, dairy, beef, and arable farms. And she's worked in a number of projects over the years on habitat, species conservation, and catchment pro uh, management projects to help improve water quality. And finally, um, Paul Cherry, who really needs no introduction, obviously farms the ground swell host farm and with his brother John has been the driving force behind this fantastic event so I'd like to invite um, each person to just give a five minute talk so if I will hand over to Paul to start off with um, that should work. Is, is this on yeah okay good um, so good morning everybody um, so, um, as you just heard, I work for Kings, and so we're, we're a national company specialising in the supply of small seeds, basically anything that doesn't go through a combine. And so, cover crops have been great interest to us for the last seven or eight years, and we've seen a massive interest in, in their use and, and expansion of their use, and, and, and an example is all, all you, you good folk here today. Um, so, while we just heard from Alistair that nitrates are very much a key driver for cover crops for many people, um, what we also see is, is that they are a driver to allow you to change your cultivation practice and improve soil structure and health. So um, this may not uh, initially have come to most people's mind in the first place, very much it was nitrates or a grazing opportunity or, or, or the general concept of soil health. But the, 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 the improvement in soil structure uh, uh, and, and um, the deep rooting of cover crops is really a very um, substantial um, bonus to most farming systems. And so what the um, cover crop can do over the winter period, uh, autumn and winter period, is create a wonderful tilth and, and, and improve soil structure or, or enhance the structure that's there already allowing much cheaper cultivations in the spring. Um, the, the same also applies if cover crops are used in a very short-term basis before winter crops. Um, and that, I think, is, is where a lot of the economics come in. Um, while it's very economical for, for, for growers to, to, to hold nitrogen on their farm and not cause a problem for affinity water, um, the, the, the cutting down of, of um, cultivation diesel, steel, manpower, whatever, um, is, is where some of the real economic benefits come from. Um, not wanting to steal what my, my other two colleagues on the panel may be talking about, the, the other interesting thing is, um, on a sort of local basis, I, I'm an Eastern Region um, advisor for Kings. It's using cover crops very carefully to help reduce nematode problems. Um, the, the, the root cropping um, 
agriculture across the eastern counties, I'm thinking sugar beet potatoes, carrots, that sort of thing, have got a, a lot of um, nematode problems. Um, we are losing active chemicals to, to help reduce those considerably. Uh, and it is very interesting that careful selection of certain cover crop varieties, not necessarily the species, but the varieties, you can reduce some nematodes very considerably. And I'm thinking particularly about potato cyst nematode, very importantly, beet cyst nematode, and that's probably the, the big driver for, for many people across Norfolk and Suffolk, um, and also some other free living nematodes like stubby roots and, and, and uh, root lesion nematodes. Um, so not, not wanting to steal anybody else's thunder, I think that's probably all I need to say for now, Alistair, and hand over to Rebecca, perhaps. Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, so obviously a lot of the conversation around cover crops is generally about um, the sort of soil health and the biodiversity that operates underneath the soil. Um, and there's lots of people going to be talking over the next two days about that. So I was just briefly going to talk about the, the sort of benefits to the above ground um, species. And so generally cover crops are used to... Uh, look at maintaining um, soil fertility um, and enhancing it, water, improving water quality and in the long term, you know, reducing fertiliser inputs. A subsidiary benefit is seen to be the, the sort of biodiversity benefit, that to farm and wildlife and the, and the wider landscape. Um, but it's a very important um, part of the picture when you're looking at cover crops, um, and particularly flowering cover crops. So as, far, as farmers are putting more of a sort of skeleton of, of a framework around their farm in terms of wildlife strips and margins and, and corner plots, this cover crop allows us to scale that operation up and provides a, a sort of rich habitat and landscape for pollinators and beneficial um, predatory insects. And that's really important, um, you know, particularly as we're losing a lot of the chemistry, um, that these become quite an important factor in, on farmland. And so the idea is, is that when you scale this operation up, you're providing that additional habitat. It's important that you have that framework in addition to that, so that when those flowering cover crops are no longer there, that there is additional habitat um, for those species to migrate back to. But you're helping to sustain and enhance the pollinator populations on the farm. And, and that provides security for the farm. If a farm can sustain its own pollinator co community, that, that provides security for your farm. Um, and you don't rely on, you know, honeybees being imported and, and those sorts of elements, because they may not always be there. So, um, and obviously flowering crops are the important element of that, and so it's, it's considering the below-ground operation of what cover crops do, but it's also thinking about what they can deliver above the ground, um, because I'm particularly focusing on pollinators and beneficial insects, because they are ecologically so significant um, everything else will follow. If they're, if they're abundant on the farm, you will get all the other ecological benefits. So they deliver a huge ecosystem service for, for all of us. Um, so I think it's important to sort of think about that as part of your strategy when you're looking at um, cover crops. And also it gives particularly pollinators an alternative place to go because they do need protection from pesticides. So it gives them alternative foraging sources um, so that they can be out in those other areas as well um, while you continue to, to utilise you know, the pesticides that you have available to you um, and not have such an impact on, on the beneficials and on pollinators. And beneficial and predatory insects also generally need another food source in their life cycle um, and sometimes that might be pollen and nectar so you're providing that additional food source on quite a scale, you know, on the farm. Um, so it can support all sorts of important insects, you know, throughout the farm, farmscape um, and benefit the landscape as a whole, so. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, from the farmer's perspective, uh, we, we started no-tilling eight or nine years ago. Um, 
And I remember thinking cover crops were just a bit of a nuisance, you know, just when you're really busy, harvest time, you've got to drill these blasted things, you've got to pay for them. Um, what on earth is it all about? We are now completely obsessed with cover crops. Um, uh, they are, um, I hate seeing, uh, hate seeing bare soil. Um, I love the, the feeling that, that, that you're keeping all the microbiome, uh, uh, biological activity going on in the soil. Um, protecting the soil either from from uh, winter rains or from from hot summer, and you know just keeping the balance going. Um, you also get the other benefit of, of obviously of, of uh, winter grazing. I mean, arable farmers around here are generally rather sort of terrified of, of livestock. It normally means they've got to work on the weekend. It's a difficult concept for a lot of arable farmers around here, um, but we, we're lucky. We have livestock, so we're sort of used to seven days a week stuff. But also, there are sheep farmers who are all really hungry for for for, um, for grazing in, in the winter. And I think my take-home message would be: um, a, don't be afraid of cover crops. They, they, they don't bite. They're fantastic. They they you know they may harbor the odd slug, but they're also harboring a lot of beneficials, so which will eat the slugs eventually. Um, and um, don't get too obsessed about, this is slightly apologies to Paul, don't get too obsessed about the species that you're, you're, um, you're planting. Just uh, keep on trialing, trial anything. Go to Paul, buy bags of whatever he's selling the cheapest of and just try it. Some will go well, some won't go so well, some will grow tall, some won't grow at all. Um, so just, just uh, keep on fiddling around and, and um, enjoy the ride. But um, they do build fertility, they do improve your soil. And um, it's a long haul, so don't, um, you know, be patient and, um, yeah, enjoy the ride. Well, thank you, Paul, Paul and Rebecca. Um, before I open up to the floor for, for questions, I'd like to invoke uh, speaker's chair privilege and then get the first question in. Um, I'd be really interested to get a view from the panellists on what they think the main barriers for farmers adopting cover crops into their rotations might be. I think um, from from what farmers tell me, sometimes it's it's cost um, because I think they think you know you've got to go out and buy quite an expensive mix rather than as Paul said, you know, just trying something. Um, there's so many combinations out there, and it does depend on what you want that cover crop to do um, as to what you choose. Um, but I think it is, it is looking at different things. And you, obviously, you've got to be careful as to what you choose, depending on what else you grow, you know, in terms of whether you choose brassicas or not brassicas and, and the effects on following crops. But um, I think cost is, you know, and a, and a nervousness about it's another job. But um, I think if you could take the cost element out, that's a big part of it. Yeah, there's also the, the whole sort of green bridge thing. Are we har harbouring... Um, you know, aphids carrying BY DV, or are we you know, increasing slugs and that sort of thing? But I think just, um, uh, just as I said earlier, just just you know, keep the faith and, and um, be prepared to be be patient and be prepared. I'm afraid to have some failures. You know, some cover crops aren't going to work, um, but when they do work, they can be fantastic. You can just you know graze them and then graze them again. So, so um, um, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I agree with everything that's just been said. Um, the, the first barrier, I think, is, is cost. Um, it, it takes a little bit of thought to quite understand how you're going to get that money back. You are going to spend probably 40, 50, 60, 70 pounds a hectare with seed and establishment costs. Uh, and just how do you get that back? But I mean, I think I can see on my own farming business that I can get that money back quite, quite well. Um, it's really great to see that Affinity are... are starting to um, put some money in to pay for cover crop growing through their end trade system. Um, as Kings, on a national basis, we talk to a lot of water companies and, and, and almost exclusively all the water companies in the UK are very interested in cover crops. I would suggest that any of you are growing um, cereal crops would, would talk to your local water company because you'll be, fine. You'll be surprised how well they will want to assist you. Many water companies are doing what Affinity are doing and, and, and paying for cover crops in some shape and form. Um, 
Many are looking at it on a nitrate basis, but many are looking at it, particularly in the north of England, on, on, on soil. They don't want to keep taking soil out of the water. Um, so um, sediment is, is a big factor that they're trying to, to reduce. So that's one way you're going to get some money back. But also just to give a plug, if it needs it, the stewardship schemes. I mean, there's some great payments in stewardship schemes for cover crops. Um, in in mid-tier, for instance, there's £114 a hectare being paid for, to grow a cover crop. And the rules are quite easy. They're not as... Uh, sort of tight as, as the EFA rules. So there's a number of ways of getting some payment back into the system, apart from saving nitrogen and improving soil structure and allowing cheaper cultivation. So I don't see, ultimately, cost is really an issue, but it is the first stumbling block that people do come, come up against. Thank you. I mean, it was a slightly loaded question, and I think Paul's um, kind of summed it up quite well. I mean, the water industry particularly, but there are also other buyers looking at this particular marketplace around cover crops. I mean, the cost of removing sediment, nitrates, and other, you know, things that are lost from, lost from the environment, lost from agriculture, are very, very expensive. Water treatment costs are increasing, chemical costs are going up, energy costs are going up. So we're, we're you know, in our, five, again, we work in five-year investment plan cycles, and water companies are looking at the cost benefit around actually how we can actually prevent these um, pollutants getting into water in the first place and actually I think there's a really strong argument for us entering this marketplace and if cost is one of the main barriers around this around not just affinity water but water companies across the country are now looking at how this can potentially benefit part of a longer term investment what benefits we can get back and start contributing to the science so I think it's very interesting and I would encourage any farmers from the UK to speak to your local water company and just get a feel that you know are they, are, are they looking at this is it something you're interested in have those discussions because there are going to be incentives there are going to be schemes like Entrade rolled out across the country going forward and you know we're all looking at different things so I simply encourage you to engage with your water companies um, but I'd like to open questions up to the floor so um, um, does anyone have any questions um, for our panellists? Yeah, I, just a quick question. How do you terminate cover crops, and would a ban on glyphosate be the end of cover crops in a no-till situation? Yeah, obviously. Um, uh, thanks, Tom. That's a, you know, the elephant in the room has been released already. <laughs> it's not even 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, so the G word, um, I feel as though we're completely reliant on, on, on glyphosate uh, in our system. Um, I, would, um, uh, I would advocate that if, um, when it comes to decision time on, on the license, that we d deal with uh, glyphosate being used as a, as a desiccant onto the food product that we're actually meant to be eating. So, you know, perhaps that's just my little plug. I think it, it's, it's nonsense talking about a, you know, if it is a carcinogen, and of course that's another uh, story, that it's weird that, we're, we're, that we are allowed to spray it straight onto, you know, onto uh, the, finished, uh, the finished product. Um, uh, we haven't worked out a way of, of, of um, drilling into cover crops uh, of terminating cover crops uh, without glyphosate, but if you do look down in the drill stands, there are there are um, crimping machines, and um, Jay Fiora, who is staying with us at the moment, was talking about um, uh, very effective work that's going on in America with with uh, crimping. I think they have a slight advantage over there. They tend to have sort of harder winters and, and um, hotter summers, and they can sort of almost set their clocks by when the frost's going to come. You crimp the day before the frost, and everything dies because um, it goes down to minus 30 or something. So, so um, I think we've got a big problem. Um, so in the meantime, Karen using glyphosate and, and um, yeah. Um, interestingly, though, there are a number of other herbicides which do a very good job. And so we've done a lot of trials and, and can certainly recommend a whole host of other products which work just as well as glyphosate, in some cases even better. They are a little more expensive um, and, and are not sort of associated with, with, with cover crop destruction, but whether we'd be able to keep those, of course, if glyphosate goes, we might find some others go at the same time. But initially, if, if glyphosate was to go, there are some very good alternatives which will do a super job. Um, but as Paul just said, you know, crimping is, is the other one. And of course, grazing um, might, might well be featuring on, on, on many people's um, minds. But flailing is also an, another way of dealing with it. So there, there are alternatives, but 
glyphosate is the number one at the moment, there's no question about that, and it will, we would all be poor if it disappeared. Okay, do we have any other question? Uh, you mentioned slugs as an issue uh, after a cover crop. Have you found that some cover crop mixes are better at dealing with the slug issue uh, ongoing? The, the, there is a, a wide range of slug activity in different um, cover crop mixes involving different species. But also it varies from farm, soil type and the rotation. I, th I think the rotation that farmers have got very much drives the initial slug activity. Um, what, one of the ways that we've certainly been investigating it, and, and Paul mentioned it earlier, is that we, we, we do now uh, find that having lost some insecticides, we are generally concerned about a green bridge. And so we would certainly in, encourage people to destroy their cover crops earlier than perhaps we might have done two years ago. So I, I would be in favour very much of most people destroying cover crops before Christmas. That's not going to work for everybody and it's not going to work in a grazing situation, but um, for instance, in, in, in very much in East Anglia, where I'm based with sugar beet and that, I'm now encouraging farmers to destroy the cover crop well, destroy it quickly and do it before Christmas. That then gives the cover crop time to disappear and that is definitely having a benefit on slug populations. It's just to add to that, I've got a question of my own on that. Um, I have heard anecdotally that if you build cover crops into your system over a number of years, that that can encourage natural predation of slugs and other uh, aphids and other pests. I mean, have you had any experience of that, you know, particularly if I say Paul or Rebecca, where you've been doing this for a number of years? Yeah, I, 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 I think so. It, 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 it's... Um we're looking. To, we're, we're we're almost trying to undo damage of, of, of sort of hundreds of years of, in our case, very semi-intensive um, agriculture and and um, restore a balance uh, in the soil and, and um, so to expect to get sort of marked results in year nine or ten is 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 possibly a bit optimistic, but um, but. We're, but we're definitely not getting the sort of heavy, the, the really heavy slug infestations that we used to get. Uh, we don't, we don't use, um, we don't use slug pellets, except in the most extreme conditions, and that really is very, very unusual now, so, and becoming less unusual. Whereas we used to buy it by the ton, you know. Um, so um, um, I think cover crops are just, it, it's a, it's a slow burn, and and um, but you can't sort of say, yeah, that cover crop doesn't encourage it to slugs and that one does and that's the thing, it's, not, it's, it's really not as simple as that. But, uh. I think that it, it sort of highlights the importance of the beneficial insects, um, you know, particularly things like predatory beetles that are voracious feeders on, on slugs. Um, and that if you, if you build up those natural reservoirs on the farm, so the areas, the permanent areas, the sort of grass margins, the wildflower strips, um, the hedgerows, that you've got your, your sort of reservoir of the predatory invertebrates. And then when you've got cover crops in addition to that, you're, you're actually helping to build those numbers. And if you can then reduce the level of insecticides that you're using on the farm because your reservoir of insects is, is building, um, you start to get a much better balance. Um, and there's more and more research being done on, on this. Um, and how you can reduce the sort of level of insecticide. And I know you get different pressure years and different rotations, as Paul says, have different effects. Um, but there's a whole army out there, you know, working. Um, and you, you need to sort of build them up and sustain that population. So you can encourage them, but if you then use insecticides, you're then not only wiping out your, your target pest, but you're wiping out all your predatory and beneficials as well. So it's, it's trying to keep that sort of cycle going of, of building up those populations. And it does take years, and you have years when they don't do so well and other years when they do do better. Um, but it's just having that as part of your strategy across the farm. 
And I think from Affinity's point of view, because we've been running cover crop trials in this area for a number of years, this is the kind of thing we want to build in and see if we can start gathering some locally relevant evidence around, you know, impacts on, on predators, that kind of thing, to try and see if we can produce some evidence for farmers in this area, work in this soil around some of the, you know, potential benefits, but also some of maybe the negative impacts as well. And that's something we're keen to, to develop. Um, I think we've got time for one more question, if there's one more question. Um, just over there. Oh, the lady just over there. Okay. I oh. also had my hand up. Oh. Um. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, we'll do yeah. two very... If we can do the quickest questions very quickly, then yeah, we'll go with the chat first. Yes, I'm interested in the glyphosate. Uh, and wondering, from Affinity's point of view, are you picking up anything in, in, in the water table? Uh, and also, wh where is it heading? Are people... As a farmer, are you hoping that you can, in time, wean yourself from the glyphosate? I'm just wondering what the, what the attitudes are. And I, I come from uh, Zimbabwe, where no-till is on the up, but it's with huge increases in the use of glyphosate, which, which was never used before. Herbicides weren't used before. So it's a, is this a thinking of Alan Savory's decision-making model? Uh, where does this increased use of glyphosate fit into it all? And, and where, where are we going with the glyphosate? So very quickly from Affinity's perspective, um, we do detect um, fairly high concentrations of glyphosate, particularly within our uh, surface water abstractions. I mean, obviously that's coming from a range of sources, not just agriculture, it's coming from amenity use, local authority use. Um, generally, from Affinity's perspective, we're able to treat glyphosate quite well. Um, it's not really an issue from us in terms of removal, but obviously in terms of any pollutant, we want to try and minimise what's actually getting into the water because there is a cost associated with removing it. So we're very much kind of keen to stay part of the debate and the discussion on that, but obviously we have to manage it from an operational and a, and, and a kind of public health perspective, which at the moment we've got that under control. So, uh. Yeah, um, we'd love to wean ourselves off it. Um, and um, one of the reasons we love running Groundswell is because we get people from all over the world who are helping us learn, but, um, and because um, we don't know what we're doing, um, learn about you know the future. And uh, there's got to be life after glyphosate. There, there will be life after glyphosate. I'd just rather it wasn't uh, too soon, really. But um, uh, until we've got a, a sort of plan B, we need to. But uh, anyway, we're working on plan B. I don't know what it is. Okay, we can do just very, very one very quick question. Last question. Hi there, it was just a question about blackgrass and how cover crops are able to help or whether there's an issue with blackgrass with those. Yeah, yeah we do grow blackgrass, thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. Two elephants have been released. Um, yeah, we do blackgrass and brome on this farm really, really well. Um, and um, uh, so what are we doing? We're trying to... to we're, we're trying to um, increase fertility. You know, black grass is, is, a, is a weed that grows because it loves high nitrogen, uh, low organic matter fields, and that's what we've created by, by, um, by years of, of, um, of over-cultivating soils. Um, uh, our, our, our sort of chief, um, when we really do get beaten by black grass, uh, Rather than ploughing, we put in a four-year lay, four-year four herbal lay, um, which I suppose is a cover crop by another name, isn't it, really? Um, we're just coming out of our first sort of dose of four-year herbal lays, putting it into beans, and um, so far, so good. You know, where there was sort of blanket black grass, so far, there's nothing. So I think we've broken that cycle. Um, I think possibly expecting a, a, a one-year cover crop to... to to really beat um, 
black grass is quite a tall order, but it's it's all part of the sort of the um, holistic you know, tools in the armory um, uh, approach and grazing, increasing fertility. It's all helping sort of beat that that blanket black grass issue. Um, s certainly, cover crops definitely, as Paul just said, are part of the overall strategy. And I think the, 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 the route that cover crops can help reduce black grass is, is what else goes with the cover crops. So it's the min till, very much less inversion, moving only the top perhaps inch of soil, um, less soil is movement is, is good. It, it's perhaps encouraging some farmers to grow more spring crops. Um, and so I think it's, it's what comes with the cover crop that's, that's the important part of, of the overall thing. And I think cover crops are making some people very much more interested in soil health and, and fertility. And, and many people as associated, well, that will be widening their rotation, which is all good as well. I mean, it, 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 it has come from too much winter cropping um, and, and, and poorer soils, mo moist soils as well. So cover crops are helping reduce some of the problems and, and what else come, comes with the cover cropping. And just quickly to mention that all these strategies that um, Paul's talked about that they're doing on the farm um, can be done as part of your farm business through countryside stewardship. And countryside stewardship is going to be around for a while. So if you're looking at it, I would, um, I would look at all these different options and, and consider it quite seriously. Uh, I would encourage everybody to uh, visit the Affinity Kings and Flag stands as well and continue the discussion. Thank you.